While this house seems like the standard Yorkshire home in Northern England, something horrific unraveled behind its walls. In fact, it was this very kitchen that the property owner, John Taylor, would freeze the decomposing body of a young girl. After several weeks, the man would wrap her body in a plastic bin bag and attempt to bury it. This was the body of 16-year-old Leanne Tiernan. She was walking alone along a dark, isolated path on the evening of November 26, 2000. The area is known as Hooligill and was less than a mile from her home. After a fun evening of Christmas shopping with her friend, Leanne decided to take a shortcut home. She had no idea that this shortcut would end up cutting her life short. She was abducted and murdered, but it took eight long months to find her body and find out who the murderer was. It was John Taylor, a 44-year-old delivery driver. John Taylor's neighbors described him as an ordinary man. They felt that they could trust him. Known as the Pet Man, he had many dogs and ferrets. He also sold pet food to people in his neighborhood. He was a divorcee and lived alone. He was fond of hunting from an early age and was often found hunting foxes and pheasants near his house. Nobody knew that it wasn't just those animals he hunted. He was a predator, waiting for an opportunity to hunt down the most vulnerable prey, including young girls. Leanne Tiernan was one of them. It was later found out that he didn't just hunt animals, but torture them too. He was a sadist who derived pleasure from inflicting pain on animals. He caught and tortured rabbits and was once seen stabbing a fox repeatedly. Taylor had two children, a son and a daughter. Both lived with their mother after Taylor's divorce in 1996. It was also discovered later that Taylor often advertised for female companions. He even traveled across the country to have sex. Knowing these details, suspicions arose that John could have had dangerous and sadistic tendencies. However, he had no previous criminal record, and the only thing he was ever caught for was the theft of a suit when he was 15 years old. On the evening of the 26th of November, 2000, Leanne Tiernan was enjoying a good time with her friend Sarah Whitehouse. After their Christmas shopping, the two friends took a bus to the suburb of Bramley. The two got off at a stop near Sarah's home, and then Leanne walked off, taking a shortcut to her home. Leanne never reached her destination. Although Leanne had taken the same route through Hooley Gill several times before, this walk back home was her last on this isolated path where John Taylor lurked in the woods that fateful evening. He grabbed an unsuspecting Leanne from behind and put his hand over her mouth to keep her from making any noise. He then blindfolded her and took her to his home. Once there, he tied her hands behind her back. He took sexual advantage of the poor teenager and then strangled her with her own scarf. Back at Leanne's home, her mother, Sharon Hawkhead, was waiting Leanne's arrival. Leanne's parents were divorced. Leanne had always come back home on time, and it was very unlike her not to respond to her mother's frequent calls. In fact, Leanne's friend Sarah, who was out shopping with her that very evening, called Leanne's home phone at around 5.20 p.m. and was shocked to learn from Sharon that Leanne wasn't home yet. A worried Sharon kept on calling her daughter, but the phone would ring and then get cut off after a few rings. Later on, Sharon called the police at 7 p.m. and reported her daughter missing. Leanne's search became the largest search in West Yorkshire. The authorities left no stone unturned, trying to figure out what really happened to Leanne. The police force searched more than 1,000 properties. They even drained out a three-mile stretch of a canal to check for a body. Leanne's family made public appeals to find out what happened to their daughter, but all of this gave nothing. No clues, no suspects, no Leanne. During the search for Leanne, more than 1,400 house-to-house -house inquiries were conducted. The police designated 800 houses along the route where Leanne disappeared as Red Route. The police also searched 800 sheds and garages. 
and 150 commercial premises around Huli Gil, but sadly, nothing was found. The authorities took another step and sourced DNA samples from 140 men who had been interviewed by the police in connection with Leanne's case. But again, they came to a dead end. Eventually, when there was no lead on the case, on the 4th of December 2000, the police released an E-fit facial composite of a probable suspect who they couldn't locate. They described him as having been seen walking a dog in the Huli Gill area right before Leanne disappeared. Other descriptions included the specifics of his appearance and what he wore. Five feet, eight inches tall, and of stocky build with a round, reddish face that may have possibly been scarred. Wearing a black woolen hat, a three-quarter length, waterproof jacket, and dirty jeans. After eight long months, Leanne's body was found. It was in Lindley Woods in North Yorkshire. A local walker had discovered the body. It was wrapped in a duvet cover in several sheets of green trash bags. There was a black plastic bag over her head and a dog collar held that bag in place. Her neck was tied with a plastic cable tie and scarf. Her wrists were also tied up with cable ties. A fingerprint assessment confirmed it was indeed Leanne Tiernan. A 16-year-old girl who had an entire life ahead of her was found in a horrific manner. It was clear to the authorities now that she had been abducted and killed. They had had already lost too much time and they knew that they'd have to look for clues and suspects as quickly as possible. They needed to act fast. The post-mortem examination of Leanne's body revealed that the degree of decomposition of the body was inconsistent with the burial in the grounds. This means that the killer had recently buried the body and had kept the body somewhere else for all those months. The authorities conducted a fingertip search of the dense woodland where Leanne's body was found and expanded this to cover an area of 20,000 square meters. The public appeal was helpful and John Taylor's name came to light. He was a poacher from Bramley who knew both the areas well, Bramley and Lindley Woods. The pet man quickly became a person of interest and a suspect in the case as Leanne's neck was tied with a dog collar. The authorities tracked all of the people in Bramley who had bought dog collars that matched the one found on Leanne's body. More than 100 pet shops and suppliers were contacted in the process. The computerized records of one dog collar company led investigators to John Taylor. From the Bramley area, John Taylor had purchased several of those dog collars. Another solid clue was the fact that John Taylor worked at Parcel Force. According to authorities and further investigations, it was found that the cable ties found on Leanne's body were exclusive to Parcel Force's parent company, Royal Mail. When the authorities searched John's home, they found the same type of cable ties and dog collars that were found on Leanne's body. There was no escape for John anymore, all the clues pointing directly at him. But even more evidence was needed to tie John directly to the case. The knitted scarf found around Leanne's neck contained human hair in the knot. Forensic experts used mitochondrial DNA testing as initial regular DNA testing was inconclusive. With the help of this mitochondrial DNA testing, the authorities were able to deduce a DNA profile and it was a match to Taylor. The work on this case is truly commendable because they found evidence of Leanne's presence in John's house too. The forensics team had found a strand of pink carpet fiber on the jumper that Leanne was wearing when she was found. Now, although Taylor had removed and destroyed all of his carpet in an attempt to evade more suspicion, this strand of pink fiber matched the small bits of carpet fibers found on a nail in Taylor's house. The forensic science service team was also able to determine that Leanne had been in Taylor's garden right before she was murdered. She had distinctive types of pollen in her nasal cavity and on her skin and hair. That's the extent to which the investigation team went in order to solve Leanne's case and put Taylor behind bars. After 10 long months since Leanne's disappearance, everything was finally coming to a close. John Taylor was arrested on the 16th of October, 2001. He was charged with Leanne's abduction and murder. He was taken to a Leeds police station for questioning. Back at his home, the investigators dug up Taylor's garden 
and found the bodies of 28 ferrets and four dog skeletons. Detective Superintendent Gregg was assigned to Leanne's case and after seeing the evidence of violence against animals, he commented, Taylor appears to have been an ordinary man, but he is not. He has a dangerous, extremely dangerous nature. This is displayed in the way in which he treated animals throughout his life. During the investigation after Taylor's arrest, the authorities interrogated Taylor's ex-girlfriends. They revealed a lot about Taylor's sexually violent nature. According to his previous girlfriends, Taylor loved tying up women and had unusual fantasies that involved sadomasochistic sex. One of his ex-girlfriends also made a shocking claim that Taylor had expressed his desire to have sex with the woman's 15-year-old daughter. After this interrogation and all of the evidence, it became clear to the West Yorkshire police that Tiernan was not Taylor's first victim. The authorities went through previous missing persons and murder cold case files to check if Taylor had a role in those crimes too. One of the first cases was from 1992, the murder of Yvonne Fitt, who was a prostitute from Bradford. Like Leanne, her body was found in a shallow grave in the same woodland. There were three other cases the authorities were focusing on. Lindsay Jo Reimer, who disappeared in 1994, Deborah Wood, whose body was found in 1996, and Rebecca Hall, whose body was found in an alley in Bradford in 2001. Could he be involved in the sad end of these women too? As for Leanne's case, Taylor pleaded guilty on the 8th of July 2002, which was the first day of his trial. During sentencing, the judge described the crime as, as cold and as calculating an act as can be imagined. He told Taylor that he was a dangerous sexual sadist who should expect to spend the rest of his life in custody. Taylor's trial, which was held at the Leeds Crown Court in 2002 and presided over by Honorable Mr. Justice Astill, defense lawyer Graham Stowe Bates and represented John Taylor. Despite direct evidence, including a DNA match with Taylor's hair found in the knitted scarf around Leanne's neck and her blood found in his home, among other things, Taylor still only admitted to kidnapping Leanne. In court, he maintained that he didn't kill her. His side of the story was absolutely bizarre and made no sense. According to Taylor, Leanne had fallen off his bed and banged her head. When this happened, Taylor panicked and had lifted her up using the scarf that was around her neck. According to him, this is when Leanne must have died. Then he was alarmed by this whole incident and buried her body in Lindley Woods. Previously in the video, we talked about the results of Leanne's post-mortem examination. The results concluded that the degree of decomposition of her body was not consistent with the burial in the grounds for so many months. This is where Taylor was caught in lying when he said he immediately buried the body after she fell from his bed and died via accidental strangulation because of her scarf. A cryobiology expert who examined Leanne's body and her cardiac tissue concluded that the body had been kept frozen for some time. Based on this post-mortem report, the judge concluded that Taylor had kept Leanne's body with him for some time between three weeks and nine months. This is possible to do without causing decomposition only if the body is kept in a deep freeze. Why did he do that? Some deranged killers do this as they think it's a trophy. This could be the case with Taylor too, or another reason could be to avoid detection for such a long time. In such cases, killers wait for a case and the news around it to die down before burying the body. During sentencing, judges still said to Taylor, you are a dangerous sexual sadist. Your purpose in kidnapping this young girl was so that you could satisfy your perverted cravings. This was a planned, premeditated encounter. It was a cold and calculating act, and the suffering you caused was immeasurable. Prosecutor Robert Smith clarified that, according to the state in which Tierman's body was found, it wasn't possible to prove for sure whether or not she had been sexually abused. But Smith claimed that Taylor's motive for killing her was sexual gratification. All of the other evidence pointed toward that. Knowing Taylor's history and hearing his ex-girlfriend's statements, it was clear that he was a violent, sexual predator. Taylor was found guilty and was charged with Leanne's abduction and murder on July 8, 2002. 
He was sentenced to two life sentences. He showed no remorse. It was a bone-chilling scene in the courtroom. He had a straight face as if it was just another normal day. But Leanne's family finally had closure and the crowd felt that justice was served as this monster was not ever getting out of jail. Judges still concluded that Taylor would have to serve 25 years before being considered for parole, which was later reduced to 20 years by Lord Wolf CJ. However, seeing the magnitude of his crimes and his remorseless attitude, it seems like Taylor will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Parole doesn't seem likely for him. Taylor was sent to Wakefield Prison, which is a maximum security prison. This famous prison also houses many famous criminals, including Ian Huntley, Roy Whiting, and Harold Shipman. And that's not where Taylor's criminal record stopped. In fact, because of the investigation into Leanne's murder, his DNA solved a few other cases. In February 2003, Taylor was convicted of two sexual crimes he had committed in 1988 and 1989 in Bramley. The first one occurred on Hooley Gill. That's the same place where Taylor abducted Leanne. The second one occurred in March 1989. Taylor attacked a young mother while she was home alone with her 18-month-old daughter. John Taylor pleaded guilty in both cases and received two more life sentences. On the 3rd of April 2003, Honorable Norman Jones sentenced Taylor to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for at least 30 years. This slims down its chances of parole further. It became evident to authorities, after seeing the manner in which he abducted and killed Leanne Tiernan, that this wasn't his first crime. It was well planned and calculated. He even froze the body for months before disposing of it. Which means there's a very high probability that he has committed such crimes before. Leanne Tiernan's family was devastated. A young and bright 16-year-old gone too soon, gone through no fault of her own. Her funeral was held on the 28th of September 2001, which was the day after what would have been Leanne's 17th birthday. After the sentencing, here's what Leanne Tiernan's mother, Sharon Hawkhead, said. Although John Taylor has been locked up, our agony continues. We feel nothing for him. We are pleased that he has been locked up, so he can't do this to anyone else. But life should mean life. After such a heinous crime against a young and innocent girl, a monster like Taylor deserves nothing less than the maximum punishment by law. Thankfully, at least legally, he got what he deserved. His crime was so horrendous that True North Productions went on to make a television documentary about John Taylor. The 2003 documentary was called Killer in the Woods. It was produced and directed by Jess Fowle. John Taylor's behavior has had some resemblance to Jeffrey Dahmer in the sense that he was also fascinated by torturing animals. While Taylor enjoyed hunting them down and torturing them, Dahmer was oddly fascinated with dissecting them after their death. Seeing the monstrous route these criminals take in their adult life gives us ideas that some major red flags were missed in their childhood. A timely assessment of mental health is key if we're to reduce such instances where deranged criminals like Taylor and Dahmer take innocent lives for their own sadistic thrills. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of John Taylor. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.